Well, good evening. I want to thank all of you for joining us for the April 2015 WIP Town Hall. It's being broadcast by Damian Capello. He's with Red Rocket. It's our spring break and a couple of days from Easter. So we have a few different faces with us today due to people being out of town. CBFO WIP Manager Joe Franco will be delivering the overview and John Heaton will serve as moderator. However, joining us from NWP today will be Scott Kennedy and Craig Suggs. Scott will be describing the bolting process and the status of panel six closure, while Craig will talk about the mitigation of radiological contamination. We do have a number of special guests I'd like to introduce. Beverly Allen and Annis with Senator Udall's office. Diana Ventura with Senator Heinrich's office. Bernadette Granger with Congressman Pierce's office. We got Dr. Martin Simon with NMED and Paul Shoemaker with Sandia Labs. Before I pass things over to John and Joe, I'd like to expand a little bit more on the technical assist assessment team's presentation to the mayor's nuclear task force on Tuesday. The TAT was a group of scientists who were assembled to study last year's release at WIP. This group's efforts complement the Accident Investigation Board's work. The scientists were very clear in their explanation that the possibility of a similar release at WIP is extremely unlikely. Also, NWP Manager Bob McQuinn explained the number of additional protective measures that are in place that will remain in place. Science is based on precision. While highly confident that the other nitrate-bearing waste at WIP does not present an additional risk, the TAT was unwilling to declare 100 percent certainty. I think what's most important here is that safety measures are in place and that closing panel 6 and room 7 of panel 7 in the WIP underground remains a top priority. Thank you again for joining with us and we look forward to hearing the presentations. John. Thank you, Mayor, and again, I'll moderate this evening, and uh, my name is John Heaton, and you can call me anything, uh, but I'm pleased to be here, and thank you all for being here. I know tonight uh, a lot of people are on spring break and visiting family and out of town, so we do appre appreciate your diligence uh, in being here, and those of you online, thank you as well. Uh, we continue to have a large number of people that listen to these town hall meetings. Uh, they may not all be online, but there are several hundred that at the, you know, by the end of two or three days have have listened to it. So it, it's clearly worthwhile, even though the, the numbers of faces here are, are small. Uh, before I turn it over to Joe, a couple of comments about uh, Scott. Um, He's been with us, or he's been in the nuclear business for some 25 years, or 34 years, I guess, is the number. And he's been at WIP for two and a half years. And again, he's the operations manager, and he's from a neighboring city in Texas. From He came to us from Pantex. So we're, we're pleased to have him here tonight. And then Greg Suggs has been with uh, the waste operation, had been the waste operations manager and has been here for some 27 years with WIP, so he's well-seasoned. And uh, he's uh, a salt expert on top of that. So just to give a, a, a little bit of uh, more uh, explanation of who they are, but they're going to be making presentations as well. So, and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Franco, the CBFO manager. So, Joe, thank you. <laughs> Oh, those of you that have cell phones, if you'd be kind enough to put them on tremble, we'd appreciate it. It is interrupting. Thank you, John. Uh, as we uh, progress today, uh, what last last meeting we had, it was uh, we talked about a year from the events, and then today we're you know we're now in the April time frame, and time seems like it just keeps flying by. Um, I'm going to give you a little overview of what. Uh, progress has been done and been going on out at the facility. Uh, for facility status, uh, we continue to be in filtration mode. All three of our hoists are operational. The air intake shaft hoist, uh, salt hoist, and uh, uh, waste hoist. 
Um, you know, and, and um, part of our challenges that we continue to discuss with you all has been the ventilation system. And uh, last time we talked to you, we had uh, changed out the uh, mod filters. And, and as you remember, there's four sections for each. We have two separate banks, and each bank has four separate sets, and each set in there has 21 filters. And so we changed out a the first 21 on, on this set over here, and, and th or this bank and this bank over here, and then uh, just this, uh, 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 was it a couple weeks ago, I they all run over to me, but uh, we actually changed the next set, which is what we call the high efficiency filters. That was changed out. Uh, the, so another set of 42 filters were changed out. Uh, that that went really well, and um, we had uh, the the team is is really uh, showing their experience that they have picked up as they perform these tasks. Uh, we had no contamination uh, of any individuals during this this uh, filter changeout. Uh, there there was contamination in the filters, so uh, you know that we took the proper protective uh, measures to make sure that our staff employees were, were protected and they actually performed really, really well. So we're really proud of them as they move through and, and maintain the ventilation system for the underground. Uh, the bolting is another item that we continue to brief you on. <clears throat> As you know, uh, you know, it, it, we, in the underground, um, we've, we selected this uh, media, the salt media, for a very uh, particular reason and it's that it would encapsulate the, the waste after uh, a couple hundred years, it would be fully encapsulated, then we could maintain this 10,000 year period. Um, but during the process that we're operating, we want to make sure that uh, the stability of the mine is, is good enough for, and, and safe enough for our employees to work down there. So one of the big things that we do is what we call bolting, and we discussed that last several uh, town halls, explain how, how we're doing that. And I just want to tell you that that's progressing really well. We have two uh, teams or two areas that we're doing. We're doing one in the unradiologic, the one that is not radiologically contaminated, and one in the contaminated radiologically area. And those are two very distinct processes that, that are, re are required to, to when you go do those boltings from the stance of what the uh, personal protective equipment they are that the employees have to wear. And, um, Mr. Suggs and, 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 and uh, Mr. Kennedy are going to discuss that. The bolting will be by Mr. Kennedy. He'll get into some of that detail. The other thing that uh, we have started is uh, the decontamination of certain areas of the mine. Uh, we've done some testing of what is the best media, um, and um, Mr. Suggs will be talking more detail uh, about that. Uh, that's going real well. Uh, we're getting uh, really good uh, progress with the um, uh, using uh, water as our media for the decontamination. Um, so that's, that's something that uh, uh, we'll continue to provide you update and status on that. And uh, as, we sh as we show you the maps and things, we'll be able to point out where we're at and what we're doing in certain areas. So we'll bring you some photos, uh, kind of explain on what we're doing with those separate and uh, individual items. Um, you know, a lot of these things, as we, as I discuss, we, you know, we're showing you all the progress, all the good things that are happening, and it's not without challenges. You know, we, as we're working down in the contaminated area, as you're moving around, uh, you do stir up some of the dust and, and items, uh, materials that are uh, contaminated, and uh, the ventilation system is functioning like we want it to, and it pulls that dust up through the HEPA filters, and it gets captured in the HEPA filters. We do have some continuous air monitors, so sometimes we have folks that are working in those areas and have some continuous air monitors with them, and you'll hear some uh, uh, report from Scott on uh, some of those as they're working, they'll get an alarm, uh, there's an appropriate uh, immediate action that's taken, and it's all that training that we've inst instituted and af ap applied with the operators and how they respond that's really important, and, and we've done real well with that. Um, and these are some, some slight contamination areas that, that we uh, know the hazards and as the workers are working around there, they have certain criteria that they have to meet and when they start to exceed that criteria, they have to do, take some certain actions. And Scott's going to kind of talk about some of those, but I want just to make sure that, you know, it's, it's not um, all of the things that we're doing, and do, they don't come out with, without challenges. We do have challenges out there still and we're working through those, uh, the workforce. Uh, has been very, very uh, 
uh, in tune and, and is, is supportive. They've been going to all the training, understanding it, uh, engaging because the training is now a little longer. Uh, it's taking a little uh, more time, more, more uh, uh, actual practicals that are going on with the, the staff out there. And it shows when they actually are out in the field. You can see the responses and how the folks are, 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 are all responding to any kind of uh, event or just in the normal operations of things. As far as recovery schedule and milestones, uh, you know, in our schedules, we have a, a few things that are uh, up and coming here in the near future. Uh, the panel six initial closure, uh, they're going to talk a little more detail about where we're, the status where we're at with that, but uh, we're, we're moving a lot closer on that. Uh, uh, we had some challenges there uh, because of the, the back, uh, which is the roof, the ceiling, and we had to go in and do some more bolting. Uh, to make sure that it was safe for our workers to go in there. And uh, again, that was in a contaminated area, so it so took us a little longer and, and approach, but uh, the team has performed that well and has made it safe for the operation, and we'll be able to show you some photos today of what's been done there. But the other thing is the interim ventilation system. Uh, we have that uh, order in place. We've started to uh, uh, look at some of the materials have, that has been completed at the fabrication shops. We'll start receiving some of that in the following weeks and uh, be ready to start uh, laying some cement within the uh, uh, next uh, few weeks, several weeks, and a couple months, and be able to have that system up and, and service, um, hopefully by the end of the fiscal year. Uh, again, the other one is the supplemental ventilation system. The supplemental uh, ventilation system, we also have that uh, procurement in process. and. Uh, and the fabrication, and, and that's going well as well. And uh, we'll continue to follow those processes and progress and make sure that, um, you know, we continue to perform all of the activities that are needed to do this safely. Uh, we have um, uh, my next uh, bullet there, the Lanol Extensive Condition Review. Uh, what I want to talk about that is we have a, a process that's going on at Los Alamos that started when, from the beginning. And it's one of those items that uh, they continue to do, just like anything uh, in DOE when we have a, 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 any kind of event that occurs. You go back and you look and see what was the extent of the condition that, that caused this, and then look at the other items that you had there. And so Lanol is continuing to uh, work through that. And the reason we bring that up is that we, um, as, as they go through and look at the different drums that they have been uh, processed through the facilities, their numbers of, of drums of concern will change. Now, what we've done is we made sure that from the very beginning that we put some very rigorous uh, controls in place for our workforce um, before they can go any, any, any uh, place that's close to the waste of concern. And uh, we have a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, those uh, uh, comp compensatory measures in place so to make sure that our workforce stays safe. Now. As, as you'll hear throughout the uh, next several months, you know, these numbers will be changing and, and just be reassured that we continue to follow what Los Alamos is doing and, and we are in direct communication with them. Um, and then as they provide us their inventory of concern and uh, as, as we continue to get their inventory data, we act, continue to evaluate ours. And uh, to date, we have no concerns with the drums that are on surface. It continues to be with the containers that are in the underground that we had specified. So again, if you hear some of that uh, information, that's what's going on. Uh, they mentioned the technical assistance team, the mayor did, and, and um, the technical assessment team had uh, finished their report and it's posted on, um, the summary is posted on our website and there's a link that takes you to the actual full report. Uh, the report is about over 200 pages. Um, the text is about 30 or over 30 pages, 36 pages or so. And then there's a lot of appendices that uh, support the conclusions and things that, all the testing that went on with that. Um, the uh, technical assistance team was there to determine what actually happened inside the drum. Not to, not to go over past the, you know, was the operation right or you know what was after the drum and, and or what caused it out at, at Los Alamos. It's really what could have been the mechanism that triggered the drum. So they, they kind of worked through that and have a little bit uh, of other items in there that support the um, Accident Investigation Board. Um, <clears throat> so some of the, uh, the 
the details will be discussed with you all. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, set up a, a separate town hall that will uh, cover the accident investigation board uh, results for the last uh, report that's coming out in the near future and uh, and also the technical assistance team report that just came out. So uh, as, as soon as we get uh, the uh, accident investigation board uh, report out, we'll be uh, coordinating with the mayor and, and setting up another um, uh, town hall to make sure that you all get uh, briefed on what those two reports consist of from the team that an individual member for, from the team that actually wrote the reports. So that'll be a separate briefing. We'll notify you, let you know within plenty of time so that you can um, set your schedule so you can be uh, involved in that briefing. And again, the, the uh, AIB report is uh, in its final reviews and should be coming out in the near future. Um, the one other item that I wanted to hit on the future briefings, uh, other than the technical assistance team and the uh, uh, accident investigation board, is that the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board is going to have a hearing here in Carlsbad um, that's on April 29th, and um, it's open to the public, and um, um, should be some po uh, notices that will be coming out and uh, inviting the public to those. Um, it's, it's scheduled uh, for a pretty long period. Uh, it's uh, from, from noon till, it looks like noon to seven or something like that. There's separate sessions that they're doing. Uh, I, th I think there's actually three sessions for the public. But uh, we'll get you more information on that. That'll be coming out. You all will see that the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board is responsible for making sure they, they provide that to you. And then we'll, we'll support that uh, announcement so that you all can uh, attend that that meeting. All right. Well, let's uh, let's kick it off. I'm gonna let Scott Kennedy um, go ahead and, and give you a status from his point of view of what's been going on out there, and and then uh, and then after Scott, uh, uh, Craig Suggs will give his, and then when they finish, then we'll open it up for questioning. Thanks, Joe. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, what I want to do is, uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Oh, I do that, don't I? I got it. Okay. I'm, I'm an Aggie, so I have to see if I can multitask here. There we go. So I'm going to go over ground control. Um, I think you've seen this slide before, and uh, the uh, green represents where we have the catch up, okay? And uh, we've done a really great job in catching up. I think you can see most of the changes probably from the last time are right in this area here. And actually, we've actually turned the corner here at West 30 going down 3080 down to West 170 as far as our bolting in the contaminated area. And we're moving down towards the exhaust drift of panel six. So we've made some really good progress uh, when it comes to the catch up bolting. Uh, when you look at the other areas, the orange um, is areas where we still need to go and do some bolting. And uh, we have a focus on that on the north end. And I call it the north end because I'm going to describe a little bit here in a minute sort of the transition between South 1950 to the north, which is the clean area, and then to the south of that is the contaminated area. But our focus uh, here in the north end is here in uh, panel A. Now, we, we have to, on catch up bolting, you're, you're, you're really never done. It's kind of like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, once you go across the bridge, then you just, you go back to the other end, you start all over again. So we're continuously monitoring our ground. Every morning when we go down, we have a team that goes through and they survey the underground. They, they look at the ground condition, they monitor the air, et cetera. So even though we may be focusing in panel A, we still are looking at all those other areas and where we need to move away and do some work, then, then we will do that, okay? Um, the one, the reason that panel eight is important, and Craig uh, will talk a little bit about this, as we go and we do our decon effort, uh, he will need some additional run of mine salt. And so we do have some that is actually stockpiled right now in the underground, which is clean, but as we need additional salt, then we can go into panel eight and we can actually mine some additional salt. And we'll go in there and we'll strategically do that. We'll monitor our exhaust and our air so that we don't load up our filters. But we will need to go in there and get some additional salt at some point for Craig, and so we're ready to support him on that, okay? So on the, um, 
on the north end of the mine here, which is the contaminated area, which is really north of, of 1950, then here at, at uh, you come into uh, East 140, about South 1950, that's what we call our transition area, okay? So when people are going to the north end of the mine, they'll, they'll congregate there, and that's where they'll actually don their, their personal protective equipment. So going to that area, for most of those people, is gonna be one pair and a papper, okay? Which is a pressure uh, air mask that they put on with organic uh, cartridges that, that filter out organics, but also the, the, any radiological particulates. And so they'll actually go through that area and they'll go to the north end of the mine, okay? Now we're actually gonna move that transition about 200 feet to the north, which is a good thing because we'll turn some more of that ground into a controlled area and we'll move it further down to the, to the north. Um, but that's worked really well. Um, I think, uh, Dale, the last time that we were there, I, I meant south, I'm saying north and south, aren't I? I meant south of, south of 1950. Thank you, I appreciate that, John. But uh, I think we went down to the transition area the last time that, that you were there, and, and the setup of that, the next time you come, I think you'll really appreciate it. It's a really neat setup, the way, that, the way that, that, that we have that now. But on the north end, and I'll get this right, but keep me honest, John, on the north end, we actually now have uh, a, a place where the people can come out, they can actually refresh themselves, they can hydrate. Uh, so on the, on the north end of 1950, you can actually eat, drink, and take breaks, okay? And that's, that's really important because when you're in the, the anti-seas, okay, and you're in there working, you actually can get, you know, some level of fatigue, right? And so we monitor for heat stress very closely, right? And so it's important that we monitor that. When the, when the, when the workers go in, they actually work as teams. And so they're actually monitoring one another, all right? And if, if there's a, any level of fatigue, then we actually bring that group out We'll doff them, they'll go through the transition, and we'll get them hydrated. So we're set up to do that, and it's working very well. And one thing that, that we're really proud of, and Joe mentioned it, we, we've had no contamination coming across that, that transition zone, which is really significant. Our, our radiological controls group has really done an outstanding job, and their program is just excelling. And uh, so we've done a really good job in, in managing our, our personnel. Now, one event that I do want to talk about, which I think speaks to our, um, to our drill program, but it also speaks to the training that, uh, that, that we have at the site and how well that that's actually uh, is, is taking place, is we had an event, and it was right here. We were in, and whenever we go down, once a week we go down with our geotechs, and they go and they do all their ground control where they're looking for convergence of the, the back to the floor, checking the ribs, et cetera. And they were in East 300 and they were right about here, about seven, South 700. They had just finished their, their survey of that ground and they were coming back. And so as they're moving to the north, I'm gonna keep looking at you, or to the south, as they're moving to the south, then the air is actually in their face, okay? So they're moving in you know, with the air in their face they had their, their uh, continuous air monitor in behind them. So we had four people going in front of that wagon, three geotechs and a radcon, and they were monitoring the, the, uh, the uh, cam was set for 300 DAC hour, and it actually went up to 417, and that was because they were kicking up dust and things like that, so there was a little bit of resuspension. So immediately the, the, the uh, rad tech, he, he told the, the other three individuals, get 100 feet up, you know, to the, to the south, away from this area. And then he, he stayed there, and as they moved and they quit generating dust, then that went down to zero DAC, okay? So they got up to the first mine phone, they called us, they made all the right notifications, we, 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 we assembled all the right people, we had all the right public address that went out that talked about we had a cam in the underground, and then all the RADCOM managers and everybody converged on that, and then we quick, quickly assessed the situation and then we basically stood down the event. So what was really impressive about that is the fact that it, it, worked, it worked just spot on. And everybody did exactly what they were supposed to do and how we've trained, okay? Now one thing, and I, I'm sure it's been mentioned before, but we do an extensive number of drills in the underground. And so, you know, we'll have a drill where we have uh, a fire, you know, and this is just a drill, but we have a fire in a certain area of the mine. And we'll actually have people that, that have just, you know, they, they, they've either just dawned 
or they're in the process of doffing, and we go through all those, those things that, that they should do, okay? Taking off their pappers, putting in their self-rescuers, et cetera. And so, you know, the old saying, practice makes perfect, then we're starting to see the, the, uh, the uh, re you know, reaping the, the benefits of that, of that practice and those drills. So that was one event, and I don't know if you were aware of that or if you had heard about that, but it, it just, everything just worked great, okay? Um, as far as um, other activities, I'm gonna go to a few other slides. I have a real-time picture. It's about, about well, I guess at this point, it's probably about two and a half hours old of the panel since closure. So I'll go ahead and move to that slide, I think, at this point. Okay. Okay, on the panel six closure, um, and this is critically important that, that we keep moving towards this closure, and we've made some great progress. Um, we, uh, we have completed putting in the, the, the uh, fan that is actually on the entrance side coming into panel six, and the purpose of that fan is to make sure that you're moving an appropriate amount of air across the folks that are working, but also when you're using diesel equipment, that you're moving that diesel particulate out, okay? You're moving it out and, and it's exhausting away from those individuals. So we, we, the, the fan was installed um, uh, last, a couple weeks ago actually, and the catch-up bolting was done to the entrance side. Now, I'm gonna show you a picture in a, in a moment, but I believe that at a previous town hall, I think the picture was where you saw all the bolts that, that were actually hanging. And so I think when you see this picture, you're gonna be amazed at the difference. But um, so, so we, we've gone into, and as of today, well, actually as of yesterday, we actually stood the, the, uh, the bulkhead up. And as of today, we have actually finished the flashing on the back and the rib. And so what we lack is the floor. So as we go forward over the next several days, then we should be complete with the entrance side of, of panel six. And then we're continuing, as I noted on the previous slide, we're continuing to bolt into the exhaust, um, into the exhaust drift, which is in South 3080 going into the exhaust drift. And we're continuing to make progress as we go into that, that drift. Now, that drift looks very much like the drift that you saw on the entrance side. So there's a lot of bolts that we have to replace as we get to that point. Scott, can you kind of point to it for where you've been talking about? Okay, sure. Um, right here is the, is the entrance. And this is where we're putting up the, um, the, the bulkhead that, that we have stood is here. And so then we're also bolting here and we're going into the exhaust drift, which is in South 3080, and we're bolting about right here at this point, okay? Okay, the one thing that before I get here that, or before I go, to, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to bait y'all in so you can see this picture because I think you're really gonna like it. But the one thing I, I, I want to mention is, is as we prepared our teams for this, um, we actually practiced bolting and doing ground control in the, in the uh, PPE on the clean side. And so, you know, think about putting on a rain, a rain jacket and, and putting on a face mask where your visibility is somewhat impaired. And so when we were on the clean side of the mine, we, we practiced bolting to make sure that they were familiar with that and they were comfortable with that. And as we moved over to the contaminated side, it actually paid dividends and it's, it's you know, they're, do, they're doing a great job. Uh, again, we've had no one that has had any issues and no contamination, okay? So let's go to the next um, picture. That's a little hard to see, but this is, if you can see up here on the, on the back, if you remember uh, previously the pictures that, that you may have seen, we had all the bolts that, that, that were hanging down. And so we've actually taken care of this back here. This is the bulkhead that has, been, uh, that has been stood up. And then this is the flashing here, the rubber flashing on the back and on the ribs. And what we lack on this is to put the flashing here along the, the uh, floor. And then we'll go in and we'll actually, we'll actually put a foam seal around that. And then we'll actually put a foam seal down where we have the the, uh, the uh, bolts that were actually attached to the to metal bulkhead, and then we'll put a little bit of run of mine salt along the, along the flashing on the floor, okay? And once we complete that, then the initial closure for the entrance side of panel six will be complete, all right? Then we'll move our focus to complete the ground control coming into the exhaust drift, and then we'll, we'll go through. And once we get to the exhaust drift, then we have a little bit more work to do. We, on this, on the entrance side, 
we had already put the renamine salt up against the waste, okay? And what that entails is putting renamine salt up about 10 feet along the waste. And then you have a chain link and brattice that you drop, and it kind of follows the, 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 uh, the flow of that salt. Then you put about, as you continue to build the salt, you put about four or five feet of salt over that brattice as you come back out, okay? And so when we get over to the exhaust side, after we finish our bolting, then we have to bring in the run of mine salt, we have to build that up, then we have to drop the chain link and brattice, and then we'll tack that to the rib and to the floor, and then we'll put the additional salt up, and then we'll be ready to erect the bulkhead, okay? All right, let's talk a little bit about our maintenance activities and infrastructure updates. Um, on the electrical, on the above ground, um, this is something I don't know how much has been discussed on the above ground, but uh, a lot of focus uh, right now we're going through. We have a lot of PMs that are due. Uh, preventive maintenance, excuse me, I'm still I'm using acronyms. It may not be familiar with everybody. But we're doing a lot of preventive maintenance on the above ground, going through and doing our quarterly, semi-annual, or annual inspections. And this is where we're going through all of our electrical switch gear, et cetera, and doing the preventive maintenance on those. Um, we have one activity uh, where we have actually uh, taken a transformer that is one of the transformers that feeds back in that actually supports uh, the 860 fans. We've actually pulled that off and we've sent that and, and we're actually getting a new transformer. We had thought about reconditioning that and as it actually went out to the vendor, we found that it was really better to just go ahead and have, have them fabricate a new transformer. So that, that is in process on the surface. In the underground, um, we have made great progress in the underground on our electrical. Uh, we have gone through and uh, essentially we have, we, have, we have power to every part of the mine. Uh, in the places where we have uh, some redundancy, we have that. Uh, we, do, we had redundancy over to the, to, the, to the north end of the mine, over to EXO, and then we had one little issue with, uh, with one of our, uh, um, our switch gear there, and we're working that our switch stations, and so we're working that. And then we're also working to uh, install the new switch station four, okay? And that'll be important. When we install a new switch station four, then we have a, a, a large 13,008 that comes down the salt and runs down south 900. It's important that we get switch station four up and going so we can reroute that 13,008, come over to the new location, and then once we have that new location, then we'll have a backup that'll go over to our, um, to our other switch stations, and then we'll be able to have the, the power and the backup that would go down to the south end of the mine also. So a lot of work in the underground, and, and it, it, it's taken us some time to do that, but we're doing everything very methodically. So we're taking down every you know, uh, panel. Uh, we're taking down our, our lighting contacts. We're cleaning those. We're cleaning those for salt, for soot, you know, to make sure that we're removing any carbon that may be in there. So we're taking our time methodically going through that, and we're doing that right, okay? And uh, we've done that without any incident uh, with the electricians and the crafts. And uh, we actually, I actually had a complaint the other day that now the lights are too bright in the underground. So I'm going to have to do something about that. So. <laughs> but we actually have, the, you know, all, we had a lot of lighting circuits that were going down some of our main drifts. We, we had intentionally taken those down, some of them. Some of them had, had actually just had, had gone off. But we intentionally have taken those down. We've cleaned those lighting contacts. We have the lights back up. So if people are complaining about it being too bright in the underground, I'm okay with that. So on the ventilation systems, um, the 860 fans, I know, you, I know there's been a lot of talk of, uh, of the maintenance on the 860 fans. That's those, we have three 860 fans, and those are the fans that provide our, our filtration, okay, our ventilation at this point. And we, we do a, a monthly rotation of those fans. So we rotated, we, and so we call those fans 860 Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie, okay? And so we rotated, um, uh, it was about two weeks ago, I believe, we actually rotated from Alpha to Bravo and we went through and, and we, we were reworking some of the bearings on the 860 Alpha. And so we have that. So when that one comes back online, we think we're going to greatly reduce the vibration. Our vibration is, is currently where it needs to be, but this should greatly improve that, that vibration on that fan and then improve the reliability of the fan also. So we went through, we did some work on that. 
And, uh, and then the next fan system that our focus will be towards will be the 860 Charlie. And we'll go through and we'll basically soup the nuts, go through that one and bring it up to the level of the 860 Alpha and 860 Bravo, okay? Now, Joe talked a little bit about uh, the filter change. Uh, we did finish the high efficiency uh, filter change this last, that we started this last Friday. We actually reduced air in the underground on Thursday night. And then on Friday, we actually changed the high efficiency uh, filters in both the 856 and the 857 filter units. And we did that in one shift. And uh, we had been doing those in two shifts, but we're starting to get the experience. We're starting to get in what I would call the rhythm of that. And so, you know, we were able to complete that in one shift. And so we were able to do that successfully. Uh, there were no issues. We had, again, no contamination. As we changed those filters, this is the second time that we changed the highs, the, the levels of radiation were, were, were greatly reduced on that. And so we were able to go in there with, you know, one pair and a papper, and actually, when I say one pair, I'm talking about anti-seeds, okay? So we were able to go in there with one pair and a papper and change those. And, uh, and so we, we've gone through, we, 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 now we've re re replaced the mods and the highs both twice. And then so we're laying out our schedule and what we're working towards, and, and throughout all of this, we're, we're collecting data. Our engineering department is collecting data. And what we would like to do is get to where we, when we do the cycle of change, if it works out, that we would be changing out the mod and the high at the same time, okay? And so if we can get to that point, we will. But what we do is we, we, we monitor the differential pressure that goes across those filters, and we'll replace them when we need to, but we think we're getting to a place with enough information and enough data that as we run our system that we can get to where we change those at the same time. And, and what that'll do is make us more efficient, okay? What it also will do is it, it, it will, you know, support putting our people in there from a large perspective. We can go in there versus every two or three months, we can go in there and we can do it, both those at one time. Okay, so we're working towards that and everything's working well on that. On the control doors and bulkheads, um, one thing I want to note on that, we have uh, three control doors in the underground. And uh, as of today, all three of the control, control doors are up and operational. Uh, in November, they were all up and operational. But as the ground moves, you have to monitor that. And we had, uh, we had two control doors. We had some floor heave on one that we had to go in and mill the floor. Okay, we did that a couple weeks ago. Then we had another control door where the, the back and rib had moved in a little bit on that. And we had to go in and we had to rework that door, okay? So at this point, all the control doors are up and operational. And then the other thing on the bulkheads uh, that as we continually monitor, you know, the underground, we're, we're continually going through and where we have bulkheads that are closing certain areas, then we have to go and we have to manage the, the floor in those areas. And so we're watching that and as we need to, then we go in and we mill those areas so those, those bulkheads will open and close um, as, as they're designed to do. Okay, on the waste hoist, uh, Joe noted all three of the hoists are up and operational. The one thing I wanted to note on the waste hoist is uh, we, uh, uh, about a uh, week and a half ago, I believe, we actually lost what's called control power on the waste hoist. And when that happened, we were about four feet off of the, uh, off the station or off the, at the base of the underground. And when that happened, our, our brakes, as, as designed, will actually engage. So our brakes engage just as they're, as they're supposed to, okay? And so, and that is one of what we call our, one, of our, one of our safety significant systems. So our brakes actually engage just as they're supposed to, okay? So we went in and we looked at that, and what we found is we had an issue with our, with our air conditioning in that area. And so we, we had to uh, go through and refurb that air conditioning unit. And we, we had it, we went through a repair, and then just this last um, uh, Monday we went through and we actually Closer, it's coming across very well. I wish you'd get some more air conditioning up here too, John. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm, <laughs> I'm not used to wearing this, so. But uh, uh, anyway, so, so we, we went through and we, and we, re, we, we repaired it uh, last Friday, 
and then we, 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 it ran through the weekend on Sunday. We had another issue with it. So we made the decision to go ahead and just re replace, which was, was a solenoid, but just a valve body that basically regulates the flow of the, of the, uh, of the refrigerant that goes in. So we, we, we had our subcontractor come out. They replaced that. And now the, the air conditioner is up and running. It's operational. And uh, we're in good shape with that. But I wanted to mention to you on that because that, that was another event where uh, when, when, when we lost that control power, okay, then, then in our world that's actually reportable because it's a safety significant system, okay? So whenever you actuate a safety significant system, then that is reportable, all right? So as that occurred and as we responded to that, again, we responded just as we're supposed to in accordance with our procedures. We, we made that report and then we systematically went through, we evaluated it, we, we repaired it, we, re, we basically commissioned it back into service, and now it's back up and operational, okay? Other equipment, I'm hoping that within a few weeks, um, and I'm looking at my boss right now, but within a few weeks that we're gonna have an electric bolter and a picture of that that we can actually uh, show at the town hall. Uh, we do have an electric bolter and a new portable power center that actually supports that, that should be here in several weeks. And then once we get that, the reason I put that bullet up there, I want to talk a little bit about the process that we go through to actually bring equipment into the site and then actually commission it, okay? So we, we spec out this equipment, we procure this equipment. When it comes into the site, you don't immediately put that into use, okay? We have to receive it, it has to go through our quality organization. Then we have to make sure that we have our preventive maintenance procedures are ready that we're ready to inspect that equipment. Then we have to make sure that that equipment is, is operational. And then we have, a whole, we have a training program that goes with that where we have to establish our training program. Then we take our operators through that and we train our operators. Once we do that, then we, go, then we have to make sure that we go through the proficiency that they can use it. And then once we go through all of that, then we can actually deploy the equipment. And that may sound simple on the surface, but it's not. That actually takes a few weeks to go through all that, but it's important that you do that correctly. One, to make sure that the equipment delivered actually works the way it's supposed to. And then two, to make sure that, that you have the people properly trained and qualified and you have the procedures to maintain that, maintain that equipment. And so we, that's just an example of one piece of equipment, but there are several pieces of equipment that we have on order that as we go, as we bring them into the site, then we'll take each piece of equipment through that process, okay? And I think with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Craig Suggs. All right, thank you, Scott. Um, <clears throat> well, as uh, the mayor said, uh, my name is Craig Suggs. I am the waste to handling or waste operations manager with NWP out at WIP. And what we have done, because waste handling personnel that, that I manage that work with me every day, waste handling personnel are not handling waste, obviously. We have turned them into a, a very efficient um, decontamination team, if you will. Um, before I ask Sam to queue up a video, I want to talk a little bit about what you're going to see in the video. We started in early March with the actual decontamination effort in the CA or contaminated area, um, and, and I can point that out on the map that, that Scott had, uh, which starts at in East 140 Drift, which is the main primary transport uh, drift for, for all of our waste when we do get back into waste handling mode. Started at approximately South 1950, and, and, and we head south with that contamination reduction or decontamination effort. And the video is gonna show you uh, it's, it's a real short clip, but it's important because I believe, as, as Jim Blankenhorn has mentioned in past meetings, we, we have actually went out and we, we determined the best technique or the best way to apply water, which is the primary decontamination technique that we're using, to apply water to the salt ribs or the walls, if you will, as well as the floor and even the ceiling or, or back, if you will. Um, and we actually have some folks in waste handling that uh, have weed spray businesses on the side, what have you. There they are well, some folks that are welders. And so we got some folks together and we asked them, what's, what's, what are your ideas? And uh, a couple of them came up with the idea that, hey, 
We have spray, there's, there's all kinds of spray devices out there where you can, you spray either weeds or for insects or whatever. Let's go look at and evaluate how we can best apply this moisture or this water, if you will. And so what we came up with, and like I said, Jim has probably shown you pictures in the past is, we have a John Deere Gator. It's a four wheel drive vehicle. They typically use it for spraying pest or weed control, if you will, um, on golf courses. And we went out and we asked the vendor to modify the spray bar on the back of that, add a 50 foot uh, hose to it with a spray wand on it so that we could um, use that off to the side where we, we, didn't, we could control it a little better than just spraying um, large quantities on the back and ribs, which we'll, I'll, I'll point that out to you. Um, so the vendor went and modified that for us. Uh, works very well. Uh, we brought it out there, we practiced with it some, made sure everybody understood um, how to use it, how to use the controls. We trained on it, if you will. And then we took these waste handlers, the waste handling folks, and they went in through some extensive, more extensive training on these actual decontamination techniques. You don't just spray water on a contaminated piece of equipment or a contaminated wall just like you're washing your car. You spray methodically. You spray from top to bottom. You catch it all. You can go back and forth, but you make sure that you, you reduce the contamination levels from top to bottom. So what we did, and the thought process was, and it's been working very well, is we said, okay, we're gonna start in this contaminated area. We're gonna use this spray gator that I described, and we're gonna spray at approximately eight or 10 feet up on the ribs, or the walls, if you will, and we're gonna spray down. And the idea is not, we're not, we're not just taking that contamination away, but what we're doing is we are actually reducing the amount of contamination on the wall by washing it down to the floor. The idea is you want the contamination somewhere that you can control it. So what we did is we washed it down to the floor, and then after we get through with our spraying process, we intend to come in and lay what's called bratis cloth on the floor on top of that contaminated salt that the water soaked into on the floor. And then we'll bring in fresh salt, which Scott alluded to as far as from panel eight or other areas in the north end. And mine ops will be able to then lay six to eight inches of salt on top of that bratis cloth. And that provides us a clean foundation. The contamination will remain underneath it. We put that bratis cloth there as an indicator so that when we're running heavy equipment across that and we're getting back into full operations in the south end of the mine, we'll have an indicator with that yellow bratis cloth. We, we ordered yellow, something besides white, which is what they typically use in the potash mines for controlling ventilation, what have you. But that bratis cloth that we're gonna put down is yellow. And if we see that yellow indicator, that means that some of our salt has been pushed out of the way or moved because of the vehicles or what have you. That tells us, hey, we gotta stop. We come back in with some more salt, cover that back up. So that tells us we know where we're at as far as where we've washed the contamination from the ribs down to into the floor, okay? So what you're gonna see in the video is uh, waste handling personnel running that gator machine for just a short clip and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about some other stuff. This gator actually has a 300 gallon water tank on the back of it, that's what you see right there. And these are the spray bars coming off the sides or off the back. So like Scott said, these folks are in, these folks are in a contamination area, they're in one pair of contamination, anti-contamination clothing, and they've got the wand out and they're just washing down the wall as they move south on that drift. And once they're done with an area, they'll move it a little bit further south and they'll go ahead and continue, okay? Pretty basic technique, but it works. How do we know it works? We've tested it.
Okay. Thank you, Sam. All right. So I talked about testing it. How do we know it works? Well, before we started, you, you notice the video said March 11th. That is the date we started actually going into the contamination area and start spray the ribs and, and, the, and the floor. We've actually performed that evolution now twice. And I'll go back if I can. And just to give you a better understanding, where we were at is here's the East 140 drift, and where that, lo where that video was shot is just south of 1950, right along in here, toward panel seven, which is over here. And our efforts are gonna continue down East 140 south, all the way to what's called South 2520, about 600 feet. And then we're gonna turn right, and we, we're gonna go on down to West 170, which is right in here, and that's the entrance into panel seven. Now, like I said, we have actually performed that evolution twice now with that gator machine. And what we were able to do is reduce the contamination levels to where RADCON, or radiological control folks, are in the process right now of completing an extensive survey of that whole zone. And the idea behind that is you want to reduce the contamination levels, okay, so that you can take the transition line that Scott talked about that's at 1950 where folks don and doff their, PP, their PPE or their anti-contamination clothing and the respirators, and you move that further south so you have more of an area where you don't have to wear that, contamin that anti-contamination clothing, okay? Our, our uh, airborne levels, we have continuous air monitors in that zone that we've sprayed already, and our airborne levels are very low literally non-existent at this point now that we've settled that down. But to prevent that from, from increasing, we're going to come back in and put the bratis cloth and the salt on it before we transition that, uh, that donning and doffing area, if you will. Okay, now I'm going to get to some more pictures. What you see here is, are just some examples of some areas that we practice our technique, if you will. Some of these areas are actually, I believe, where it says before and after. That is actually an area that, that we tested that was, was just in a clean area. What we had to do, because we'd never tested this water salute, water spraying technique, if you will, is we had to go into a clean area in the north part of the mine. Waste handlers went down there and they had handheld sprayers, some more sprayers that the guys come up with, 25 gallon tanks that had a, pump, a pressure sprayer on it. And they sprayed and, and just washed the wall down and just made sure they understood the technique and how it was going to how it was going to work okay we also then took those same sprayers and we went into a contaminated area we went into panel 7 we had two pairs of anti contamination clothing and a paparon and we sprayed some walls in that area as well because we wanted to get some real time test data if, or real time data if you will to make sure the things were going to work the way we had planned what we did early on, before we even started this, and I hate to back up, but I need to point this out because I believe, again, Jim has talked about this in the past, is we as a, the DOE and NWP, and we, we went to uh, Idaho National Engineering Lab and said, hey, help us out here. You folks at the lab, take a look at how you believe we can reduce our contamination levels. We got contaminated salt. It's never been decontaminated before because it's not been contaminated, all right? So Idaho took some salt core samples up there, and they ran some, some lab tests, if you will, looking at several techniques. One of them was, obviously, the water wash. What happens if you just wash it off? Well, it reduces contamination. It removes it from where you don't want it and puts it somewhere else where you can handle it better, either cover it up or what have you. They also looked at using uh, fixatives. There are different types of fixatives out there in the nuclear world. They use them at at other DOE sites, they use them at uh, nuclear power plants. When you have spot contamination on walls or in rooms or what have you, they use that fixative to cover it up and essentially fix the contamination onto the location. It might be on the floor or what have you. And then it's obviously it's properly posted and, and, and labeled properly. Okay, so they tested some fixatives for us as well. They told us what those fixatives were. We went out and did some testing as well in the clean area on those same fixatives. All right. What we settled on, not settled on, but what we also looked at is using paint. Uh, fixative is kind of like a paint, but it's, it's a thicker type material. But because some of the guys, again, some of the folks that I work with in waste handling were, had painted, some of them used to paint true packs at EPD, um, they said, hey, why don't we use these sprayers, these airless sprayers, get some paint that's low VOC, meets certain, you know, the criteria we needed to meet, let's try it. So we did. So uh, we went down in the clean area, we sprayed the areas with paint, covered the wall real well. Uh, we, would, we then went into the contaminated area, and just like with uh, what I'm showing you here, 
with that before and after, we took an area in panel seven, we, we measured it off, we painted it. We found out that what it did is it reduced the contamination levels drastically. And you can see that the, uh, the uh, statement there says less than or gr little greater than 95% mitigation on just the first pass. Okay, and what, I, what that means is just the first try at it, we were able to reduce contamination levels on the ribs greatly, okay? Um, we have also used that paint already in that same drift that the video was, was being shown in on an overcast. We have an overcast on the ceiling or back, if you will, and it's a metal overcast. And by that I mean what it does is it allows the exhaust air coming from panel seven over in through that closed off environment, if you will, and out through East 300, which is our exhaust drift. And what we did in order to make sure we weren't getting any leakage or anything and there was no issues there, is we went ahead and painted that. Our radiological control folks said, hey, we'd like for you to paint that to fix any contamination that might be there. They went in, they made some swipes, they found some contamination, so rather than wash it off, have it drip down, we turned around and we painted it. So now it's a nice yellow color, okay? So it's a technique we use that works. Um, the contamination doesn't all come right off the rip. You still have low levels of contamination on the rib. This last bullet talking about resulting contaminated brine trapped within the salt rock. Folks will tell you that, and you can imagine, salt is absorbent. It's dry down there, okay? So what happens is you apply the moisture to it. Some of that moisture doesn't run down, but what some of it does is it soaks into the salt. Salt is hydroscopic. That's the fancy geological term for it, I guess you could say, okay? So it absorbs it. Well, what happens is some of that contamination absorbs back into, into the salt. That's okay. We expect it to happen. Again, that's a, that's a result of or an understanding of some of those tests that were formed at the Idaho National Engineering Lab. So we allow that to happen as well. The remaining contamination that gets, again, washed onto the floor, like I said, the plan is we're going to cover it up. That way we control it. Okay, this, uh, you always have to worry about, and I'm sure folks ask, what about resuspension? Well, we control that. We're going to put bratis cloth down as an indicator. We're going to cover it up. We're going to put fresh salt in on top of that. We're going to water that salt, pack it in good, and that will allow us to run our equipment across there, and that'll reduce the amount of PPE, personal protective equipment, basically anti-contamination clothing and possibly um, peppers. That, that we have to wear in those areas, and it'll make it easier for the workers to, to actually perform their job duties, like Scott talked about. It's a little difficult, it's not impossible, but it's difficult to wear a papper that could get cloudy or what have you, and then go perform your intricate work, okay? Our ultimate objective in waste handling is to take the contamination techniques that I've talked about, move south down East 140, all right, to the entrance level, entrance to panel seven, possibly reduce it all the way down to where we can, we don't have to go into that area anymore wearing pappers, but maybe just protective clothing. And then when we get into panel seven, we're gonna continue to decontaminate. What we're doing right now is we're cleaning up equipment. We were trained by some radiological control personnel on how to wipe down equipment that's contaminated. You wipe it down with a certain technique. It's not like washing your car where you do like this. You have to do it with a certain technique. Our folks were trained. We practiced on the surface for several weeks to make sure everybody was comfortable with what to do. They go in that area with two pairs of anti-C's and a paparon and their materials that they use and they clean that equipment. We have cleaned several pieces of equipment that are in panel seven that were contaminated as a result of the event. The objective there is we clean that equipment up. Now, we haven't cleaned it up to where it's totally clean from a contamination standpoint, but we do what's called gross decon on it. We remove as much of it as we can. What that allows the us to do then is to do some maintenance on it eventually and go in and have my folks, the waste handling technicians who are going to run that equipment, start it up and drive it out of, this, out of the disposal rooms that they're sitting in right now, the mined out disposal rooms, okay? Because what we're going to use is this technique water spray in panel seven. We're gonna not only spray the ribs and the floor, but we're gonna spray the, spray the ceiling or back as well. So we're gonna spray the entire area, surface area of the salt. We may then also come in, and, and we haven't finalized this, but we've thought about, we've talked to some other folks about the fact that in panel seven, because the levels are, are higher than where they are in, in, in that East 140 drift that was on the video, we may, and we're gonna be the intent is to go in and eventually in place waste in those, in those rooms. We may spray a fixative of some type, may just be that paint that I talked about, on the floor before we then go in and put the bratis cloth down and the clean salt on top of that. 
So we'll work our way in methodically into each one of those rooms, okay? At the same time, Scott talked about panel six closure. We're in the process of getting ready, as you well know, to eventually close panel seven, room seven. But the remaining rooms, six through one, we will take the time to go in one by one and spray, lay the bratis down, lay the salt down, and possibly a fixative, if you will, to reduce the contamination as much as possible, okay? Pretty simple techniques. Waste handlers have gotten very good at it. Um, like I said before, we're not waste handling. Those folks have stepped up, very proud of the team that I've got, that I manage, that I work with every day. We send about eight of them down every day. They put, in, they put, down, put on their anti-seize and their, their uh, uh, respiratory protection, and they do that by, by training. I mean, we trained extensively, like I said, before we got to March 11th, and we did several mock-ups to make sure everybody understood Here's the way you put your clothing on, here's the way you tape it up, and here are the things you gotta watch for, all right? Makes it very good for them, very safe for them to go in, perform the work, and then be able to back out without being contaminated. And like Scott said, we haven't had any incidents uh, that I'm aware of. My guys, um, we're, we're gonna go down tomorrow and work on a forklift. We're gonna clean up, clean, begin to decontaminate another forklift in panel seven um, with a team of about eight folks. So, it, it, again, it's working very well. Um, the result of the Idaho test were very helpful, um, allowed us to understand better what could be used. Um, like I said, it's never been done before. Um, we tested different sprayers. We have handhelds. We have the, the Gator machine now. We have, uh, we have different types of airless sprayers that we use for spray, spraying paint and what have you. So it, it's really a matter of Testing first, planning up front, training properly, and then going in and making sure the process works, okay? Um, these different techniques, like I said, they're working well. I don't see us having any problems. Again, that's my personal opinion. We have been, we have seen outstanding results so far. Uh, the airborne levels are virtually nothing in that zone area down East 140 that I showed you in the video, and we're just waiting to finish up the Bradis and Salt and Radcon to finish their survey, and then they'll move that transition line back, which will take us to an area that we can go through and work without all the extra respiratory protection and what have you. It's a much safer environment. Now, you're probably thinking, well, how do you, how do you, don't you double check that periodically? Yes, we will. We will continuously monitor from a rad co radiological control perspective, the levels of contamination that we, that we may or may not have in those zones. We will, as we move forward, we will always be monitoring and we'll always have those airborne monitors, continuous air monitors set up to make sure we understand what we're working in. All right? Um, I think that's about it. I'm gonna turn it back John, over to John. John? Thank you, very, very informative presentation. So, uh, questions? Uh, Anybody in the room have questions? No questions. Very good explanations. Abe. What kind of water do you use in the kitchen? So, so we asked what kind of water we're using it. The answer is just like you said, just normal tap water. Just water out of the faucet. We open it, set it down, put it in the tank, and spray it. Okay, any, any others? We have four or five. Mary? In panel seven, am I hearing correctly, you're going to decontaminate it uh, and take the equipment out. And how are you dealing with the drums, the area of the drums for okay. decontamination? Okay, so, so as I understand your question, you, you understand that how we're gonna decontaminate, reduce contamination on the walls, showed you the video, and then I talked a little bit about wiping down equipment, not to the point where it's gonna be what we call free release, so we can take it into any part of the mine, but we can use it properly in the way to do further waste handling in, in the future, okay? We are not dealing with the drums. The only area that we have drums, as Scott pointed out, and I think has been pointed out in, in presentations past, is we have waste drums in place in the exhaust drift in panel seven, room seven. It's the very back room of the, of the panel, all the way back at the uh, back end of that room, is, if you will, and into the exhaust drift. That's the area, as Scott alluded to, that we're actually gonna seal off 
So the, the, the way we're dealing with that, because that's where the event occurred, right, is we are going to, right after we, after we close panel six, all right, the next step then will be to go in there and have our crews go in and they will seal that off just like they did panel six. Okay. So as Craig was noting, when you, whenever you get to panel seven, room seven, then we'll put a bulkhead here, and we'll put a bulkhead here. A little black dots the waste. Yeah, the, and, and here's the waste right here, as he was noting in, in room seven. I'll do a few and then we'll check the room again. Um, this was one I received uh, from an email yesterday. When and where will all of the references and documents, I believe this is probably best for Mr. Franco, when and where will all of the references and documents cited in the TAT report be publicly available? When will the TAT hold a public technical meeting regarding the report? Okay, as I, as I mentioned, uh, those, an those questions uh, would be uh, best answered when we have the technical assistance team here and they will be able to provide you all the details that you want on where the actual reports will be posted, what will be posted in the documents that they have referenced and also uh, as I mentioned in the beginning uh, we will let notify uh, the folks of when we will have that uh, uh, if you want to call it special or the other uh, town hall that will address the accident investigation board and the technical assistance team. So that's in the near future here, uh, waiting for the AIB. How much of the documentation is online? Uh, all the technical information um, is online, is that correct? Well, what I know right now is that you can actually pull up the report. Now, the source documents that are referenced there, I don't know if they are all available. So, I, again, that's something that the technical assistance team can answer that. Do you want me to go ahead and continue? Or? Okay. Uh, since the TAT was, uh, was unable to inconclusively identify the root cause of drum 68660's explosion, would the DOE remove the drum and remediate room 7 if the enemy directed them to? Just let me get up here. Uh, what will happen then uh, is, for, for us, is we will continue to work with the state, uh, with New Mexico Environment Department, about what the next path is uh, they have provided us the information and, and approval for us to go and put uh, closures on, on panel seven, room seven. So we're gonna follow that process. If we were to receive a different uh, uh, notification from the state, uh, we would work with them and, and seeing what, what the issues or items of concern were or are. Uh, we believe that the process and approach that we have provided to the state, and which they have agreed with their uh, approval, is for us to just isolate that uh, panel, uh, room se panel seven, room seven area. Okay, you want me to continue, John? Yes. Please. Okay. Uh, with the, uh, with Let me make one comment. Okay. I, I think to characterize it as an explosion is inappropriate. It was a runaway chemical reaction, and it was the gases and the heat that uh, allowed the drum to, uh, or the material from the drum to escape. And it was, you know, I don't think it's uh, any way could be characterized as an explosion at all. It was just a chemical reaction that over some period of time, I was, I think, prepared in November. And by the time it, uh, February rolled around, things had finally built up and it was, it was just a slow uh, process of a, of a chemical reaction occurring. Okay. Um, th this, these are similar to questions we've um, had in the past, but it's several questions about the use of, of water spray. Uh, one is how will the high pressure water spray be used in panel seven react to the MGO? And then aren't the workers' suits being exposed to the water spray? Can't the water actually cause things to spread? Okay, so first of all, we're, we're not spraying near any MGO. Uh, we don't have any MGO in the disposal rooms that are empty, don't have any waste, rooms one through six. So the idea is we will spray water first, and then after we get it, the levels down um, to where we can go back in and start emplacing waste, we'll, we'll be done with all the water spraying. So there's no spraying around the MGO. The only place we have MGO, magnesium oxide is what it, he's talking about, is, is in room seven. 
uh, where the event occurred. And as I alluded to earlier, or pointed out earlier in the question was, um, we will seal that off and we will not be spraying anything. And we won't even go into that area after we seal that off. Okay. Okay, so 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 back back to the second piece. Of, okay, so to follow on with that, when we spray the back or the ceiling, if you will, of each room, again, we're going to spray that, allow it to dry, if you will, and drip down, and we're going to simply spray from back to front. So we will back out of the area as we spray. We'll work our way in, and then we'll start back out, and we'll spray above the head. And we do have suits that that are um, not. That, that are resistant to chemicals, water, what have you, that we'll be probably have to be wearing in that area. It depends on, we're going to do some practicing first with that technique, with the, with the sealing technique first, if you will, to make sure we understand just what type of volumes it's going to take and how that dripping is going to occur. And then with respect to the MGO, again, keep in mind, we'll go spray a room and we'll spray the ceiling and the, and the walls with this spray gator device because it has a spray bar on the back of it and we'll just spray behind us as we, as we drive out of the area, okay? All of that will occur first and it'll dry and the salt crust will form that I talked about with the hydroscopic properties of salt. We'll, put, we'll come in after it's through dripping and dry and we'll put down our bratis cloth and we'll put down more salt, possibly spray with a fixative if you will. We'll spray on the floor again like we showed in the video and all of that will occur long before we start placing waste and MGO in those rooms. So it'll be dry and either fixed or washed down long before we ever put any MGO or waste in those rooms. Well, we really won't even need to do that. We'll, we'll just, like I said, it'll be dried out. We'll, we'll have it, we'll be done with that long before. We won't go right in behind it and start placing waste. There'll be no water and MGO mixture. Okay, given the unstable ceiling areas in front of panel six, how, we, how do you plan to close that? Can you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, I'll, I'll read it as written. Uh, with unstable ceiling areas in front of panel six, how will that panel be closed? Okay, so um, I, you know, as we go into panel six, so we the, the the picture I put up shows the entrance, and before the previous picture, you saw all the bolts hanging, et cetera, right? So we always bolt with you know making sure we have good ground behind us. So we'll go into the exhaust drift, which will be down 3080. We'll do the same thing we did on the entrance side that we'll have the good ground behind us and we'll bolt our way in, okay? And then we'll be, we'll be monitoring that with our geotechnical engineers to make sure that that ground is, is basically stable so that then we can go in and we can then do the, the uh, closure as I described, okay? Okay, um, you want me to do a couple more? And just a reminder for people online, while I'm asking these, I'm not able to get the new ones at the same time, so I'll try to get those down the road. I think that's um, all right, Mr. Franco. I, this probably one is probably best for you. Uh, what is the current status on the fifty-four million dollar fine and proposed hundred million follow-up fine? Okay, and that that's uh, alluding to the um, compliance order that has been given to us in Los Alamos, and uh, we continue to work with the state in that. And that's about all I can say. Uh, I can tell you that uh, work is ongoing with the state of New Mexico, and we'll continue to do that as we progress in that uh, with that compliance order. Okay. Um, anybody in the room have want to catch up? Or okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'd like to to say that. I'd like to introduce uh, Steve Holmes. He's here from uh, Santa Fe for the yeah. state of New Mexico and New Mexico Environmental yeah. Department. And so. Okay. Um. Uh. Thanks, we. Steve. What will a PPE or uh, types of PPE be when you finally finish deconning and then start closing the panel six? So, it, you know, once we go through the decon, then, then we'll have our radiological controls come in and they'll evaluate that. And so, it, you know, once they do that, then they'll describe back to us and what would be considered a radiological work permit, then they'll tell us what that PPE will be, okay? Now, we anticipate after we do the decon, it could be something less than what we're wearing today. But after we do that, they have to go through, they have to characterize, and then once they characterize, then we'll know what that PPE will be, okay? And in addition to that, I assume everybody that wears PAPRs is, is on medical surveillance, is that correct? Right, there, we, they, you have to go through a, a, an evaluation, medical evaluation, you have to go through a fit test, and then on every entry, 
you have to go through and they have to take your vitals, okay? Every time they, they take their vitals. After they're done with that entry and they come out, then we take their vitals again just to collect that information to see how that person is performing, okay? Has anyone considered the fact that this drum, even if I don't say exploded, the top pretty much popped off of it, that this is not a good, a good enough protection for this waste? Uh, even Lanol, when they have their nitrate salts, they have them in metal and glass containers. And I know we probably researched these containers, you know, before we built them, but I just thought about this today, that maybe these containers aren't as strong as they should be. Yep. So with, with um, the, all of the investigations and items that have been looked at, you know, the, the drums that we receive um, go through a testing period or a phase, and they're all uh, 7A, uh, Department of Transportation 7A criteria. The, this drum, you know, uh, when we look at it and we, we look at what the event that occurred and caused this to happen, to us more importantly is why did that happen and what it was the, the root cause of the event to keep it from happening again. Uh, we believe that the actual, um, uh, the WIP facility, the, the mine piece, the geological formation that it occurred at, uh, is actually the, the best place that it could have occurred. It, the, the repository performed exactly like it's supposed to. That didn't, that didn't fail. What failed was some of the operations uh, of how we, you know, the mechanical pieces of the structure. Uh, we have looked at uh, different uh, uh, items there. And now, as the Accident Investigation Board gets completed and it gets, we receive that, we'll see what their final outcome was of that event and we'll apply some corrective action plans to that very specific uh, item there. And so we'll be looking at, you know, we may be looking at, is, is, is the 55 gallon drum the right uh, uh, package? Uh, we'll look at what, for us, the big thing is what is the root cause to keep that from ever happening again? So we don't have that here uh, occur again on, on our facility. You want me to take a couple? So I, I, I think really waiting for the AIB report, which will be out in a couple of weeks, and they will have, as Mr. Franco alluded to, a significant number of probably recommendations on how to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Uh, and, and I think that how the waste gets prepared, how it gets treated, all of those things that are absolutely high priority in terms of of, of when it gets to the, the WIP people, that then they're, they're doing the characterization, they're doing the x-rays, and they're doing the neutron activation and some of the sampling. All of that, uh, when it gets to them and it passes that last criteria, it should be fit for put, uh, putting into WIP and putting on a transport, in a transport vehicle. Uh, and there were just significant failures in all of that. I don't know how else to explain it. The waste just wasn't treated correctly. And so what those observations will need to be in the future and how it will be overseen, uh, I'm sure they'll have some very strong recommendations and I think there, people are already thinking about how to, how to do that. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll answer that question in a couple of weeks. <laughs> okay, John, I'm gonna do the couple that I have left here. Um, since the HEPA filters were not changed out to date, where can radiation readings and swipes for those filters be found or made public? Okay, so on the, on the HEPA filters, and we're talking about the two units that are in the 856 and 857, we, we have not changed those out to date, all right? The way that that system is set up is that, is that you have two filter banks before those in, in each one, in each, each unit. And Joe described it a little bit where you have a mod filter, which is like 60% efficient. Then you have a high, which is 90%. So that's catching a bulk of, of what we would expect to come through there, right? So, so we are looking at that. The day will come when we do need to replace those HEPA filters, 
But as you look at the differential pressure, and we monitor that continuously, the differential pressure, those are performing acceptable at this point. So there's no need to go change those at this point, right? So what we're seeing is on the mod filters, as we mine, as we bolt, then, there, then you're getting a lot of salt that comes in on the mod filters. As those load and it pushes through, then you see the high. So I anticipate the mod and the high will be what we'll be changing frequently, and then the HEPA will be something, and this is, and I'm, and I'm saying this based on what I know today, and this is just me saying this, the HEPA will be filters that we would not anticipate changing very, very frequently at all, okay? But right now they're performing as they should, and so we have not taken any out to, to evaluate those at this point. Just to, to add to that, there is a criteria for us to change those filters, If, like Scott said, for a differential pressure across the filter and also a time. There's a time uh, allotted for how long you have them in place. So we'll be monitoring those and then the change. Now, when we go in there to do the change, they do go in and do a survey and that's when we'll find out exactly what, you know, what's on the filters and be able to then develop a radiological work permit to support the work activities that are going to go on for that activity. Yeah. Why don't I do one more? Or, okay. This is a PPE-related question. Have the numbers decreased since you began the spraying process? Are the workers wearing decimeters on the outside and inside of the protective suits, and what are the readings? Okay. So the workers, they, they would wear their, their dosimeter on, on the inside of their, of their, of their, their, their uh, suits. So as we... Um, you know, have been going through the area, as they come through the transition area, unless they're going down into panel seven, into like room seven, as they come through that transition area, we're finding very little contamination as they come through that, through that transition. And so, um, you know, but, but the, the, the uh, TLD is worn on the inside, and as they're coming through, we're seeing very little. Even when they go into the exhaust drift, where you expect to see the very most, when, when we, um, the one event that I described where we had the, the airborne that actually came up to 417 DAC hour, when they came through, the highest reading we had on the booties, which is a cover that goes over the, the uh, feet, was like 1,000 D per M. So it was relatively low uh, as we went through that transition with that. So the other part, you know, and Scott mentioned that number, that's actually a very low number. Uh, so, uh, but the, the, um, they have the thermal luminescent dosimeter inside, but at the same time, there's continuous monitoring with employees that are performing the work activity. So it's not like that's the only thing that's being used to monitor. And then these other pieces of equipment that they're using to do the continuous monitoring, they have alarm limits and set points so that if it alarms, then the operators know that they're in a position where they now need to take immediate action and, rem and leave. And that's kind of what Scott had mentioned about earlier, that. That's what triggered their immediate actions on the items before. And so uh, it's, it's continuous monitoring and then they have the monitoring that they have that they have in, in uh, close, to, close to their body. Okay, so, so the question was, just for clarification, is why are we spraying down at approximately 8 to 10 feet up high on the ribs down to the floor? And, and, and the answer is, is we have uh, electrical power that, that runs, that's the power cables and what have you are hung up way high. And, and we have boxes and, and junction boxes and, and things that, that instrumentation, if you will. And really, the, the working area is what we're focusing on, okay? Because our operators are gonna be running equipment down that area. We're focusing on that eight to 10 foot high zone all the way down to the floor because that's the working area, what we consider the working area uh, of, of any, any part of the mine. Now, to follow on with that though is any activity that will occur anytime we have to go up and, and and do any maintenance or look at anything above that eight to 10 foot area that will have been surveyed and we'll have the levels there. There will be controls in place. And like Joe mentioned in RWP, radiological work permit, the radiological control personnel with their instrumentation will go and survey that first and they'll make a determination. Okay, if we're gonna work in that area. The workers may have to have certain PPE, anti-contamination uh, 
clothing on, if you will, to do that work. But that work doesn't happen on a regular day-to-day -day basis like it does in that working zone eight, eight feet and below where we're driving our equipment and, and doing that. And, and, and part of that, to, to answer that, you, you're worried about more airflow. There would be more dust as we as we move equipment. What I mentioned earlier, I believe, is talking about the yellow bratis cloth as an indicator. From, from the, from the from, oh, from, from, from up from up above, we we could see that. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll be monitoring that. I, I don't think we will, but we will be continuing. That's one reason for continuous air monitors is to fully understand what you have. Yeah, the, the surveys, the, the, really, the contamination, the higher levels are down on the floor where we've washed it to, and then we're going to cover that up. Oh, the height. You got less contamination. Oh, yeah, you yeah. Have less yeah. So, so just one note on that is, too, as, we, as we've been bolting and doing ground control in the back, we, we have found virtually nothing up at that height. Thanks, John. Okay, I just wanted to close. Uh, you know, I've been uh, doing these for a few of these now, and I uh, wanted to make sure that you continue to hear my message about uh, we continue to uh, stress for our workforce that uh, we, safety is our first and priority. And, and I'll continue to stress that. I know that uh, Bob McQuinn and, and uh, Jim Blankenhorn are, are put, you know, that's part of their culture, part of the normal activities out there. And uh, we have the uh, uh, bargain unit president, Ricky Fuentes, that is also engaged with us in making sure that we put safety first uh, for our workforce, uh, also protection for the public and the environment. Um, we also stand ready. If anybody has any questions about the activities that we're doing, we'll answer those for you. And again, you can submit them to our DOE, uh, Carlsbad Field Office uh, website, and we'll answer those for you. I also want to inform you that uh, I'm very pleased with our workforce, both the federal side and the contractors. As you've heard today and you've heard over the uh, 52 weeks plus, uh, we have uh, 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 made tremendous progress. Um, you know, in the beginning, there was a lot of concern about how, how slow we were going. Now continue to say, you know, we're going to keep our pace, and, and that's what we've done. And we've done a really great job of making sure that we haven't uh, injured anyone and that we have not contaminated anybody in our efforts to, to recover the facility. I'm very proud of our workforce, uh, that they have continued to support me in the decisions I've made, and uh, they have been uh, one uh, very super team to, to be working with. And, Wanted to state some of those because as you see these new folks that are uh, in here, you see Craig and Scott giving these presentations. They um, are, are you, you can tell that they're dedicated. They're giving you what they know out there. It's not something that they're write, reading a script. It's the actual work activity that's happening out there. You'll, you'll start seeing uh, more of that. Uh, we'll be bringing in some of our federal staff to be able to provide you some of the information as they work through with the contractors as we continue to make progress in our facility. Again, very proud of our workforce. Uh, they continue to do a, a great job. I'm proud of our management team that we've been able to hold the, the line on our safety and making sure that our employees are protected and we'll continue to do that in the near future. Uh, we'll continue to have these um, uh, town halls and uh, like I said, the one for the uh, technical assistance team will be, jo they'll be joining the uh, accident investigation board uh, and then we'll, we'll let you know with uh, enough time so that you can plan to be here and ask them the questions you have. So thank you very much. And don't forget the 29th, uh, the, the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board will be here as well. And it, there will be three open meetings during that period of time and people should be able to come. This is one of the major groups that oversee all of the nuclear facilities in the DOE complex across the country. So uh, come and it'll probably be at, where, where are you? C Civic Center, okay. So 
uh, just want to point that out again. So thank you once again for being here and all of the all of you that are online. Thank you for participating. We appreciate it very much. Have a nice Easter.